Welcome to another episode of Growth Hacker TV. I'm Bronson Taylor, and today I have Blake Kamajir with us. Blake, thanks so much for coming on the program. Yeah, no worries. Thanks for inviting me. I really appreciate it. Absolutely. I think we're going to have a fun conversation. You've done some super interesting stuff, and I think people are going to learn a lot from it. Um, in case people aren't familiar with you, uh, you pioneered the social gaming category, um, so you're kind of a big deal. You created some of the biggest apps on Facebook a few years back with over 50 million users, things like vampires and zombies. So you yeah. did some stuff that affected a lot of people. So let's talk about viral growth for a minute, all right? Uh, what did you learn about viral growth during that time, uh, back a few years ago with uh, vampires and zombies and that kind of era? So I, I had had a good amount of experience doing viral uh, growth in the past. I was, I was an early uh, uh, engineer at Plaxo. Uh, I was, and prior to that, I was doing uh, MySpace widgets, and 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 had grown some uh, some of those MySpace widgets pretty aggressively, uh, and then I had done causes on on Facebook prior to doing these games. So I, I had a good amount of experience going in, and you know the opportunity to have learned from a, a lot of you know fantastically talented people in the space as well prior to doing that. Mm -hmm. Um, but obviously, you know, those games were very much so. You know, another opportunity for me to learn some some fantastic things. And uh, you know, probably the most amazing part of it that I was able to learn is just the uh, and 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 obviously there's a million lessons I could speak to. Mm -hmm. um, but one of the most interesting for me was that um, the mythology of a game actually affects and influences user behavior. So people do not um, you know respond to products uh, in the same way. And you'll you'll have uh, I mean keep in mind like just as a very very strict example. Uh, the the vampire game and the zombie game, right? I know they're both you know kind of silly sounding, but um, the really cool thing was these games were identical in every respect except for the picture. And I mean the code base was the same code base. It was just like you know if you know we're on this application, show a zombie picture instead of or you know else show a vampire picture, all that sort of fun stuff. So it was very, I mean very much so identical um, at first. Um, and what I realized actually. And running certain numbers is that just by telling people like you know with the exact same mechanics, the exact same narrative, everything identical, but just that subtle difference of saying you are a vampire versus you are a zombie actually would uh, result in different behavior. So ran uh, an analysis of you know who was interacting with whom and the uh, this this notion of, of of infecting other people with you know you know making them a vampire or making them a zombie. Mm -hmm. Um, the really cool thing I saw was a uh, correlation between uh, who people uh, would, 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 would bite to an attack um, based on the myth. So in the, vamp in the vampire myth, because that, uh, the, the, the moment of infecting someone, it, it's typically associated with, associated with seduction. Uh -huh. um, you had people commonly, like it was something like an 85% correlation, they would uh, bite the people that were uh, of the sex to which they were attracted. Um, and so, and, they, and so, it was lower numbers, but uh, because there was, a, you know, like a sexual implication to the moment, they would always, almost inevitably, always go for people to which they were attracted. Mm -hmm. um, whereas the zombie uh, game, people behaved; they, they they were indiscriminate. There was no correlation whatsoever between that, which is consistent with the myth as well um, of the zombie myth. You know, zombies. There's, there's no moment of seduction. It's simply like, <laughs> you know, yeah. Uh, yeah. you know, just random attack everywhere. And we saw the same sort of thing, which was this you know, just random everywhere scattering and to see correlations like that when the only difference was a picture and me saying here's this myth, here's that myth and people behaved consistent with the myth to which they were presented Yeah, and it goes to, sh it went to show me like language is incredibly powerful in viral marketing mm -hmm. that just the tiniest of difference dramatically affects the way users are going to interact and share your product. Yeah, do you think and that the takeaway from that? Word, yeah, this was one word and a set of pictures created a dramatic difference. Yeah, that, and that's a great example. I'm so glad you shared that. Um, do you think the takeaway is that um, at the moment when you're asking someone to share, to really test that language and don't assume just by throwing something up, and it, is it the moment of sharing and the language kind of surrounding that that's kind of the that's, fulcrum there? Without a doubt, and I mean, and, and the language part of it is difficult. So there's, without a doubt, I mean, viral marketing has a very strong, uh, a very strong math and science element to it mm -hmm. that you can learn a ton about and you, you, be, you become very well versed on. Um, the more difficult component of it is, is, is this artistic element of it. So, 
you can imagine, like, you know, I mean, if, if you go to art school, you become, you could become technically a very good painter, but that doesn't necessarily mean you, you're inspiring and that you can move things forward. Um, and, you know, I mean, you can make beautiful paintings, but it doesn't necessarily mean you're going to be Michelangelo, right? Yeah. And the, the interesting thing um, about viral marketing is not only does, uh, is language such a critical component of it in terms of executing well, um, language is evolving constantly. So it's, it's, it's without a doubt a moving target, and what worked exceptionally well two years ago and, and felt like, you know, this, this cutting edge, very colloquial, kind of like I'm, I'm connecting with a particular audience mm -hmm. with these words, you know, in two years' time could be, well, that seems dated and awkward, and this yeah. feels like my grandfather trying to be cool, and, you know, it's, it's lame, so why would I check this out, you know? And, and it's, it's, it's phenomenally difficult. You feel like you're on a treadmill mm -hmm. trying to keep up with the, the pace at which language uh, uh, does evolve and change. And, uh, you know, a key part of, you know, any viral marketing message is you have to connect with the audience and they have to feel as though it speaks to them. Yeah. And yeah. without a doubt, doing that is hard because speaking to that audience changes in very quickly. Yeah, no, it's so interesting that you go to language so quickly in the interview. Uh, we had James on, who was the CEO and founder of Tickle, uh, another massive viral app early on. And we start the interview, and he wants to talk about language. And I'm like, wait a second, let's talk about viral coefficients. Let's talk about, you know, uh, your, the, the positive net score. It's like, no, 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 let's talk about language. And so it's so interesting that you're on saying the same exact thing. Absolutely. Language makes such a huge difference. And, I mean, you can imagine um, – uh, what's, what's, what's another like phenomenal example of this? You can imagine that uh, speaking, uh, what's a good way to put it? Like as you watch things like, uh, and I, I think part of it, let me, put a, let me try and put this in very concrete means. So as you watch things like Two and a Half Men and listen to pop music and watch, you know, say Jersey Shore or, or any of these kind of like show, these reality TV shows, mm -hmm. um, it's very easy for, for a lot of people in Silicon Valley to dismiss that as like, well, that's, you know, pop culture that I'm not interested in, you know, I like listening to jazz music, I don't want to, uh, you know, listen to Britney Spears or One Direction or any of that. Mm -hmm. um, that's fine, but if you're trying to reach a massive audience, the vast majority of your audience is most likely they're entertained by pop culture, you know, they're not reading, you know, frankly, they're not reading Shakespeare or James Joyce or Faulkner, um, they're reading Harry Potter, and it's, you know, you can, you can argue till you're blue in the face that, like, you know, the writing style of, of Joyce is, you know, far superior, but, you know, like, I'm sorry, it, it, Harry Potter is, you know, is, 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 is uh, what speaks to a, a much broader audience, and it's accessible, and, and people get it, and, I guarantee you a huge part of that is the language. You could take the same story, and if, if, if William Faulkner wrote Harry Potter, no one would have ever fucking read it. No <laughs> way. No way. It would be in, like, it would be the extreme of consciousness of, you know, like, first person, half of it. Um, maybe part of it would be second person. It would be so confusing and awkward, and people would be like, I have no idea what's going on. Mm -hmm. And... Uh, it would not be, you know, a multi-billion dollar franchise with, you know, I don't even know how many movies now. Um, <laughs> I know, right? Can't keep up. Yeah, and I, I think that, you know, you, you can tell the same story, you can communicate the same information, um, but if you don't do it in an accessible way, you come across as, uh, you know, elitist and as, um, you know, obnoxious. And, and a lot of people, particularly in Silicon Valley, are awful at language because they write this, you know, in a, in a way that they may speak to, to their colleagues, and they're, they're trying to communicate a message, and they may think they're kind of trying to be funny or entertaining, but it unfortunately comes across as, well, you're, you're trying to be too clever for your own good, it seems obtuse, it seems, you know, elitist, yeah. and it seems like an, an, an Ivy edu educated rich asshole wrote it, and that's because he did, um, quite frankly, and, you know, you that's not how you reach a massive market, right? Yeah. So, so uh, often, you know, they, yeah, so they, often I'll read the taglines like below a logo and it's like, okay, so you wrote that for VCs, like humans don't know what to do with your company though, <laughs> you know? Yeah, without a doubt. And, and you know, your, your average consumer, now don't get me wrong, if you're building a product that, you know, is, is designed for Silicon Valley engineers, by all means, you know, you know, keep your language technical, keep it, you know, uh, 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 keep keep you know sound, you know it's fine to sound you know well educated and really sharp and intelligent, mm -hmm. um, but uh, God have mercy on you if you send someone to a dictionary 
because, uh, well, I, I say send them to a dictionary. If you write anything, that, you know, if you use a word that they don't know what it means, like, the average person does not pick up a dictionary saying, well, I'm curious about this. What does it mean? Or I pick up a dictionary like, like anyone knows that anymore. But nobody, no, people won't even go to the trouble of looking it up online, the meaning of a word. Um, instead, they'll just be like, I don't know what this means. Boring. Let's go look at funny pictures of cats. Right? Yeah, absolutely. And, you know, I can't blame them. It's, uh, you know, they're, they're not, you know, learning is not, you know, this fun, exciting thing that people want to do all day. Um, it's usually more work and they're just, you know, people get enough work. You know, Blake, I've read online uh, in a couple different places that a lot of the organic user acquisition techniques in social games actually came from you. Um, tell us, what are some examples of those organic user acquisition techniques that you kind of originated? Right. Um, so, so obviously there's, there's quite a few out there. Um, <clears throat> at its core, uh, a lot of them stem from uh, you know, at, at its core, I made. Uh, oh, and I'm, I'm seeing the video coming up again. Uh, is it is it okay? Uh, yeah, I think so. On my end, I think it is. Okay, cool. Uh, <laughs> all right. As long as you can see it, I'm good. Um, so, uh, at its core, uh, the the set of techniques that uh, that you see used over and over again by many many games is making uh, you know the making the viral marketing part of the gameplay, right? So. The very first time, um, I there was actual like incentive uh, within gameplay to uh, bring someone else into it, to, and, and 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 fundamentally, any viral product becomes better uh, by having a network on it. Mm -hmm. And to date, prior to that, the vast majority of games that anyone had made, and certainly no one had ever reached scale with any of them, um, was simply like, hey, you know, harass your friends, and you know, like. Tetris by themselves too, right? And you can compare yourselves on a leaderboard. I, I thought that was lame at best. Um, and uh, marketing and I made the user acquisition part of the gameplay. Perfect. Um, so you know that now that manifested in multiple ways. So um, obviously, in terms of like, uh, I gave people an intent to like, okay, you get further along in the gameplay by having and by amassing an army. Um, and now you see things like, you know, neighbors and, you know, friends and what was it, uh, entourage, all kinds of things like that have come about. Um, uh, I also did uh, gifts uh, for the first time and actually saying, like, all right, here's you know, a gift that you can you know, reach out to someone and send them to like, come join the game and have this particular uh, opportunity to, to, to receive a gift and start off that way. Mm -hmm. um, the interactive users that were not part of the game yet, um, so I actually allowed, so if uh, I was playing the game and I was an active user and you were not, you could actually still interact and, and you, you had this, uh, you, you actually were an NPC within the game, but I branded the NPC as you, and so I could still interact with you, but, uh, and, and that of course interaction, you know, came to you saying, hey, Blake's trying to interact with you in these following ways, mm -hmm. and, uh, you know, you're, you're a weak NPC, well, I didn't say a weak NPC, uh, <laughs> Obviously, because nobody knows what an NPC means in the gaming world, um, and then uh, and then you know several other techniques. Uh, let me think of a few more. Um, so, uh, oh, I actually um, bringing people to the platform. Um, so, you know, Facebook doesn't need this anymore, but at the time, um, we actually let you uh, invite people like and bring them to sign up on Facebook and send you through uh, directly to the game. So we actually uh, uh, leveraging. Uh, techniques like email and stuff like that to bring people to the platform so that they could get your game, just to give you that additional market penetration. So, uh, yeah, so, uh, I was very, you know, and, and, and these things have kind of like, you know, they set the stage for just a multitude of kind of variations on that, but, mm -hmm. you know, fundamentals uh, were all within just a, a very short time period, you know, as I was building those games. Yeah, no, it's great. It's kind of uh, great to hear about all the different things you had your hands in that really are fundamental now. Um, do you feel like any of the techniques that you were doing back then are underutilized? Like you did it and it works and people just didn't recognize it as a part of the equation that mattered? Well, I think, you know, most of the techniques, now I, I definitely saw, um, you know, for a long time, I saw some things just being blindly implemented in an identical way and, and you know, without any like optimization around them, which is, you know, certainly, you know, disappointing. These days, though, um, people are without a doubt, like, you know, optimize and, and come to, like, okay, here's the, you know, perfect balance of, you know, these five elements in terms of making sure a user remains addicted. Mm -hmm. 
Um, I think that, uh, you know, I, I wouldn't say any of those techniques are underutilized, but I would definitely say some channels are underutilized, um, particularly uh, email as a channel. I am, like, like, email is one of my favorite channels to interact with people on, mm -hmm. and <clears throat> it's um, incredibly neglected. I see, uh, and I, I think for many people, uh, email doesn't do well, and, and they, they, they've kind of created this self-fulfilling prophecy of saying email isn't valuable, and so we're not going to invest very much time in it, they, they, and you know, after doing a half-assed job, you know, they get half-assed results, and then they're like, aha, see, email didn't perform well, like I said, it's not a good channel. Mm -hmm. um, but, but there's, you know, so many opportunities to do an exceptional job with email, and, and recently, um, you have companies, uh, I think, you know, Groupon and Living Social are both examples where they leveraged email in a very smart, uh, impressive way, yeah. and that grew the user base. Um, so did Dropbox. Dropbox did an amazing job with email, um, and it, you know, it's, it's, it's paid off in a big way. Yeah. What are some of the keys to really making email work? Because I agree with you wholeheartedly. I think email is awesome. Um, it, it's a huge, I actually think about it as much as I think about the product that it's trying to create a viral loop for or trying to market like but what are some of the keys to great email kind of loops yeah so um really and truly like it's you know the fundamentals that that exist on any on any, any product like manifest themselves in email like so obviously you know whatever the audience is you have to connect with them in the language you use mm -hmm. right almost always shorter is better mm -hmm. right it's very rare that longer is better and i mean again it's you know, depending on your audience. Now, if your audience is writers, sure, maybe they, they want, you know, you, they want a story, right? They want a novel. But most people want you to get to the point, right? Um, and so usually, I mean, I mean, like I said, the vast majority of the time, shorter is better. Um, a lot of people worry about things like, uh, like in Silicon Valley, people are like, oh, it has to work on plain text and, and this sort of thing. Fuck that. <laughs> Nobody, unless you're like writing for like, you know, Linux engineers that are using like Elm and Pine, yeah. like your plain text email is fucking stupid and like make it look nice for crying out loud. Yeah. We respond to pretty things. Um, now, without a doubt, you know, images and stuff like that, you're not going to get auto displayed around, but um, that doesn't mean you can't have uh, some, some elements that, you know, graphically make the email look a little bit nicer, mm -hmm. uh, say graphically from a layout perspective and that sort of thing. Um, Images are good. In general, people respond very strongly to happy, smiling faces. That is in human nature. We, we like seeing people happy, and we like seeing happy faces. Mm -hmm. um, and then, you know, uh, and then from a language perspective, in general, you know, where you can, if you can, you know, connect with the person emotionally, um, that's hugely important. Um, if you, now, you know, there are shortcuts to connecting with people emotionally, usually things like humor, help kind of establish that common ground faster. Now, yeah. humor is not always appropriate, mm -hmm. um, depending on your product, right? You know, so, so uh, you know, if you have that as a tool that, that you can use, then, then by all means, use it. Um, but, uh, and, and I mean, you know, Groupon, again, is a great example there. Like, they're cat and everything. Yeah, they're funny, yeah. And, and they have a personality to them, and they're well-written. I, I, I think that that's impressive, and I, I think that, you know, obviously, connecting with your audience is, is a huge part of that. Like, something that's personalized and feels relevant to you is going to get a better response instead of, you know, what's, what's a good way to put it? Um, instead of just kind of like something that does feel like, okay, this was just generated for, you know, everybody using the service and has nothing to do with me necessarily. Yeah. Um, people don't care that you, uh, you know, have a new blog post on some irrelevant subject to them, right, you know, as a company. What they care about is, you know, what did they get, what's in it for them, um, and if you're not speaking to that and doing so in a personal way, then of course email is going to give you the numbers you're hoping for. No, that's, that's great advice on all those things. Uh, you know, you use kind of the Facebook platform to grow, you know, vampires and zombies. Um, do you feel like that Facebook is still a viable option for viral growth or should people focus on things like email more so? I mean, what, what do you think? I, I think that, you know, obviously, given, depending on your product, it's, it's going to perform better uh, on particular platforms, right? And, and I would say, you know, Facebook is a, still a phenomenal platform. I know that, uh, what's a good way to put it? I know that it's, you know, fashionable to say, aha, growth on Facebook is dead. Mm -hmm. I've heard that, like, you know, once a month for, <laughs> let's see, the platform launched in 2007. 
So coming up on six years this May, mm -hmm. it's, it's, it will have been at least once a month someone declares it's impossible to grow on Facebook. Mm -hmm. And then like a month later, someone does it and they have this amazing new service and, you know, this great product. And it's like, oh, here, you know, now Spotify did this. And people are like, oh, my God. Well, but now that's the last one. <laughs> and, and, you know, after you hear that so many times, it's just like, I think that, you know, Without a doubt, it, 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 it does require a certain amount of finesse and skill and talent to do it right. Mm -hmm. You also have to have a good product, right? I mean, I, 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 and, you know, there's plenty of amazing things to still be built, and Facebook is a phenomenal platform. Now, is it the perfect uh, platform for every product? You know, no, right? Without a doubt. Um, I think that, uh, uh, you know, email is a wonderful, amazing channel, and, you know, if you have to choose between them, uh, that's too bad. Um, but choose whichever one's ideal for your for your platform. For I'm sorry, for your product. Yeah. Um, if you can, ideally, you'll leverage both. Um, and you usually see a lot of companies doing both. Absolutely, we see Facebook. They're the kings at email marketing. I mean, oh, yeah. every time somebody does anything related to your profile, you're being emailed about it. Well, why? Oh, yeah. Because they know that's how they drag you back into their system. They so, are Facebook, and they use email. <laughs> it's phenomenal, and I think that like the the problem is too many people don't understand the user. They they try to put themselves in their users' shoes without recognizing that, I mean, especially for a consumer-facing product, you're probably not your user. Mm -hmm. um, and so, you know, for all of us that treat email as this work queue where it's like, okay, here's the things I have to get done. Every time someone, you know, every time you get a, an email from Facebook, it's like, ah, uh, here's this thing I have to take care of and I have to manage and deal with it. Yeah. Um, and I'm trying to get work done. That's our response, and that's because you know we're we're building companies and we're busy, and we can never possibly catch up on on all the things we want to get done. The average person out there, it's like, oh, sweet, um, you know, this is an interruption mm -hmm. to you know to to work, and you know, like work is not what they live and and breathe for. It's it's a it's a means to an end, um, and that 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 means is so that they can get to the things they enjoy, and one of the things they enjoy is. Interacting with other people on Facebook, right? That's such a good point because on Facebook, I've turned off every single notification except one. If you send me a direct message in Facebook, I will be emailed about it. Beyond that, I don't care what you thumb up. I don't care what you like. I don't care about anything because that, it's a work queue, right? But the message, I have to get those because they're too relevant for me, right? Yeah, and some people do send work-relevant messages through that channel. And, and, and people and, interacting with their clients, so you're absolutely right. <laughs> Absolutely. And I, I think that that is, you know, um, and, 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 you know, if you think about it, uh, the vast majority of people don't change their default setting. Mm -hmm. uh, and and they, they receive all of that email mm -hmm. and they, 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 they don't mind. They like it. It's like, oh, sweet. You know, I, yeah. I have an excuse to now go check out something. Yeah, just hearing you say all that, like, it helps my thinking. Like, literally, it helps me understand why that I'm unlike them and why that's okay, but why I'm marketing to them. So, you know, I need to just live in their world and, and do the things that they actually want. Um, now, you mentioned you were at Plaxo before and some other places, and you're actually an engineer. Uh, is that correct? Yeah. Yeah. Um, tell me, does being an engineer kind of give you an edge when it comes to the viral growth that's built into products? Because it seems like there's a trend in your products that the products market themselves. Like, there's hooks in the product. Does being an engineer give you a leg up, or could anybody really do this? I mean, I, I think, you know, where it gives me a leg up, maybe more than anything else, is that I, uh, you know, especially also having, you know, done my own products, I was able to build, test, analyze, learn, and have many, many very short cycles. And I mean... Without involving other people. Exactly. So it's not like I had to convince someone to try this. I didn't have to say, you know, work with someone and wait on it. I was able to be like... This is the most important thing I want. I'm going to get it and, and get that immediate feedback on it. Yeah. So I think, you know, if anything, um, you know, like, I mean, you know, as an engineer, it could certainly be a disadvantage because, you know, it may be tougher to put yourself in the, sh in, in, in the shoes of a customer and kind of really see things from their perspective. But the big advantage was just I can collect data and iterate faster. Mm -hmm. um, and, and, and I think that that helped me learn a lot of things quickly. Yeah. Um, yeah. No, it makes now, a lot of sense. now, obviously, from a product perspective, you know, it, it also helps if you, you know, just from a design perspective, if, if you're the engineer, the designer, the writer of all the copy, mm -hmm. you have all of that in one mind, you can get kind of this coherent experience throughout of it. And, and I, I do think that's advantageous. Um, and, you know, it's, but obviously, it, it, it doesn't scale once the product gets, you know, starts to get big, right? You have to involve more and more people to, to keep it sustaining because, uh, you know, 
one person uh, is uh, can only go so far. <laughs> Absolutely. No, I like what you said about how you know different people uh, when they're doing these different roles. Communication is really important because you need cohesion. Um, and, you know, so with my companies, for instance, like I have to speak, you know, to the copywriters and the person doing the design and the person doing the engineering. And part of my role is just make sure that communication is crystal clear so that there's yeah. a unified vision, you know, as yeah. close as we can make it seem to one mind being put out yeah. there um, because people will respond to that. It's hard to respond, you know, emotionally, like you mentioned before, if they feel like four people worked on it and it's obvious you, you can't get emotional about stuff. Um, now, you also mentioned you were part of Causes for Facebook. Uh, I don't know what the last uh, public number they released is, but they probably raised over $100 million by now. Um, and so you've had $100 million, you know, being raised on this, uh, this social thing that you've done. Um, you've also had, you know, uh, you know, how many millions of people, 50 million people, whatever, on zombies and uh, vampires. What's more difficult, do you think, kind of seeing both of them at some level? Um, is it harder to get a user to a game? Is it harder to get a dollar for a charity? <laughs> yeah. Um, well, so I, I think that, you know, without a doubt, so I mean, the, the, the team at Causes is phenomenal. And, and you know, m you know there, there, there's a larger uh, audience, uh, I'm sorry, a larger, uh, you know, team there than, than we're ever involved in my games. Yeah. So I think that, you know, I would say, you know, while they're, they're, they're definitely, I mean, they're, they're different, without a doubt. Mm -hmm. I, I would say that you know causes was was a tougher thing to build in that uh, there were certain kind of things that were off limits. You couldn't do like now now you could do some things. You could be like, hey, it's for charity, so let's be aggressive, right? And you uh -huh. could be very pushy. Um, but some things you couldn't do, like you know, I, I mentioned earlier, humor is is wonderful for kind of breaking the the breaking down. Uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, kind of like those barriers and establishing an emotional connection with people. Now, with a product like Causes, you know, if you're trying to raise money for cancer research, you can imagine you can't make jokes, right? It's, it's I, I, you know, it's so, you know, you, you're going to come across as indelicate and insensitive to a lot of people. And so, you know, certain things, like, I mean, when, you know, if something entertains you, uh, you're more likely to interact with it in some capacity. And suddenly, you know, one very strong emotional connection that we can make with people was, you know, kind of off the table and not allowed to, to tap into. Yeah. And I think that that makes it harder. Now, you know, the good news is, you know, the, the other emotional connections you can make with people in terms of, like, do you care about, you know, this very important issue like, you know, cancer research as, you know, that's a very strong and powerful thing there. Mm -hmm. But um, I, I would say causes you have fewer tools to tap into. Yeah. Um, and, and so, you know, you, you had to do the ones you had, you had to make sure you did a phenomenal job with. Mm -hmm. and, and the team there, I mean, I think, uh, you know, I can't say enough good things about them. Mm -hmm. They they really helped them knock it out of the park in a big way and continue to do so for, yeah. for many, many years. So I'd say that one was a, a little bit tougher. Yeah, it's just I wanted to ask you that because I just wanted to know kind of what the differences are, you know, because um, very few people travel in both of those worlds at any part, part of their life. So you've traveled to them both in a pretty short period of time. So I, yeah. I, I was assuming there were some differences there. Now, let's yeah. talk about your, uh, your most recent company. You're the founder and the CEO of Media Spike. Um, so tell our audience, uh, what is Media Spike? What does it do? So uh, what Media Spike does is it's, it's, a, it's a platform that connects uh, brands and game developers in a way that lets you do product placement as part of the gameplay. So, you know, product placement in TV and film is a very mature industry. A lot of people, you know, are very familiar with it. And it, and it gets great results, right? I mean, now, obviously, you have to do it properly. Otherwise, you will get a negative reaction from an audience. Sure. But, um, you know, done well in games, it has phenomenal results as well. Um, now, historically, uh, all of the product placement deals that, that you've seen in games, and, and it's, 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 it's not a new concept. All right. Mm -hmm. This has been done for years and years and years by many, many people and many companies before us. Um, what's unique about us is we're trying to approach the problem for the first time in a scalable fashion and, and trying to make it so, okay, look, you know, by using a set of technologies, you're now able to do this at scale in a repeatable way and in very lightweight, uh, uh, quick manner rather than what's historically been happening for games, which is, okay, we're going to do this one-off, this integration is going to take, you know, all of this dev work and, uh, you know, so because it's all of this work and all this planning, uh, we need to plan it, you know, months and months in advance and it has to be this huge expensive thing. Um, so what you end up having is very few of those deals, even though they, they perform exceptionally well, um, 
I mean, and they, they perform exceptionally well, not just for brands and for developers, actually. Users really, really like them because it makes the gameplay more realistic, you know? I mean, not surprisingly, if you give the average user the choice between, do you, wanna, do you want your, your basketball player, that, you know, character that, that's running around, do you want him wearing generic sneakers or do you want to put Air Jordans on him? You know, obviously people are like, well, I, I would much rather have the Air Jordans. That's, that's cooler, right? It's more authentic. And so uh, the, the users actually prefer it too. And that's, uh, that's what makes this type of uh, integration so unique is actually it enhances the game experience and makes, makes for a better game rather than uh, being something that is at the expense of the user experience and kind of saying like, all right, well, here's this compromise we had to make in terms of we need to you know, generate some revenue and we have to perturb the game experience and make it not perfect anymore and ideal like we wanted. Yeah. But uh, the, the truth is these things cost money to build so we have to, to make some money on it. So the really unique value proposition is here's an opportunity to you know, do something that you know, does generate money for the game, gives brands the exposure they want, and has users you know, actually happier with the game and, and makes you know, kind of like this, this, this holy grail or holy trinity of you, know, you want all three of these parties to have a better experience and be happier as a result. Yeah. And so you can deliver that. The difference is, for us, is we actually built a set of technology, and the, historically people haven't been building technology to try and solve these problems. They've done it as like, okay, let's have some people that specialize in it, and you know, that, that specialize in brokering these deals, and act as middlemen to kind of connect these two worlds mm -hmm. that, you know, that need each other. Yeah. So we're, we're, we're bringing AdSense kind of thinking to that world. <laughs> yeah, let me ask you about that, kind of as a side note. Um, do you think there's this immense opportunity in marketplaces? Because I mean, we're starting to have marketplaces for the big stuff. It's like we have the Craigslist, we have the Airbnbs, but like what you're doing is not even in that realm. I mean, you know, it's so far away from a Craigslist and a house and a car. Like we have marketplaces for the obvious stuff, but there's so many things that are not obvious, like in you know, in-game advertisement. Do you think there's a lot of wide-open categories, or is there still just a few left? There's there's so many that still exist. I, I mean, really and truly, there's. There's absurd inefficiencies in everyday life all the time, and I mean, there's no shortage of things that like people are going to complain about and be like, "This is such a waste of time. This is inefficient." Every single one of those is an opportunity to, you know, for 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 a system to exist that is more efficient. And I can tell you, I mean, like, for goodness sake, that like the mail system, right? Like the U.S. Postal Service is an amazing opportunity. For a marketplace where I, I don't know about you, but I would happily pay a dollar a month to never receive, you know, I, I mean, when I go to the mailbox, I like open it up and I'm like, great, here's a bunch of chores. I got to throw all this shit away, right? Um, and you know, and there's maybe one thing in there. That, well, if one is probably generous. yeah, exactly. <laughs> so, I mean, in everyday life, there's an, there's there's no just a multitude of opportunities for efficiencies to be brought in, and and marketplaces do that. Now, unfortunately, marketplaces are not easy to pull off. Um, Airbnb um, is a phenomenal success story. I know they've done some amazing things, and they're still growing and continue to do so. But it wasn't one of those things that um, it was not easy to, to, to kind of keep, get that market demand and supply going and, and to, to build it up. And it's, it's become capital intense for them to, to really expand like they, they should. And uh, getting it there is, you know, not easy, without yeah, a doubt. Talk to us about that a little bit, because um, yes. you're building a marketplace. I mean, you have to deal with this every day, the supply, the demand, the chicken and the egg, how to build up both sides without building up either side too quickly. You know, there's so many little things that go into it. Um, so maybe first, give us some examples of the kinds of games that you're working with and the kinds of brands, just to give people a, an idea of some of the larger name people that you're working with, and then tell us how you're trying to solve that problem with, uh, with Mediaspike. Yeah, so um, so we work with, with uh, a number of different games. Uh, the majority of games we work with are kind of, I would say, they, they represent the uh, kind of like the most natural product placement opportunities you could think of. So that might be, you know, sports games where they have, you know, signage within the game, you know, and it's like very natural to say, okay, this is, um, you know, having, having you know, uh, a particular brand advertised on a football stadium is something that we already see in the real world, and that 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 you know is, is an easy, very natural, uh, you know, product placement for people to, to to be exposed to, as well as things like kind of the uh, the simulation games that are set in modern times. So those games where it's like, okay, you know, I'm in you know a house or I'm in a city, 
and I'm expecting to see, you know, in modern times, certain brands. Now, you can obviously do product placement in games that are not set in modern time. Um, it just requires a little more work, a little yeah. more thinking. Yeah. Um, you know, you can't put, you know, a modern car in a Knights of the Round Table type game, right? Obviously, no. what you can do is say, like, all right, this particular car brand, you know, could be like a saddle or it could be a horse. And, you know, it's a little bit like tongue in cheek and a little bit like creative. But we're not focused there right now simply because, you know, having, you know, asking people to make that additional, like, kind of like creative leap um, is something that uh, we're not going to focus on just yet. Simply because, you know, we have, you know, we have limited resources like any company does. Um, and, uh, and, and you want to kind of say, like, all right, what are the easiest parts of the market to tap into first? Um, and so that's, that's where we are right now. Now, um, as far as uh, the brands we're working with, um, and this, this gets into just kind of how we're getting to it. We're working with uh, household recognized brands, things that are uh, some of the ones that I think uh, we've done. I, I always got to be careful around who we've announced and who we haven't announced. Right. <laughs> so, um, but, but without a doubt, you can probably, uh, with a quick search, see which ones we've already announced. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, for, for both of those in terms of getting the games and also getting, you know, the brands and, and building this marketplace, what's been key for us is leveraging the personal relationships we have. So for myself, obviously, having been in the game industry and had you know this awesome opportunity to meet so many people and, and work with them in many capacities. Like I mean, you know, some just you know, you know, when you've had six years of just kind of like you know having dinner and mm -hmm. spending time socially with, with with an industry, you know, you get to know a lot of people. And so being able to you know when you approach them and say, hey, look, I've built this really cool thing that I know solves a problem we've all been talking about for a while. Um, you know, would you like to try it out? That's that's a much easier kind of like uh, uh, ask than if, hey, here's you know, I'm some random person you've never heard of. You know, trust me, you know nothing about me, but I made something cool. Don't you want to try it? It's a tougher sell. Yeah. So, um, and then think about that specifically, because um, I think it's a great point for people to really understand the impact of that. It, it's so easy for young entrepreneurs that don't know what they're doing to pick a category they have no experience in, they don't know a lot about, they have no connections, they have no, they have no collateral you know, socially to work with. Um, is it a much easier way to grow something that's adjacent to something you've already done kind of successfully? Absolutely. I, I mean, you know, I, I think that, uh, especially if you're, if you're trying to know, if you're making something consumer facing, uh, the audience doesn't care about your pedigree, right? They just care about you know, the, the, the product and is it doing, is it solving the problem they want it to, right? Now, obviously, within business, people take that into consideration, and they're like, "Well, wait a minute, I'm about to invest some of my business resources, and I, you know, I, you know, quite frankly, uh, you know, there's what's a good way to put it? Um, nobody, uh, nobody's going to question your decision to go with, you know, say you're a bank, right? You know, you work at a bank, and you're like, all right, let's use Oracle for our databases, right? Mm -hmm. No, no, nobody ever got fired for deciding to use Oracle, you know, for for, for bank software. Um, but you know, if it's you know, here's this new random amazing database, uh, and it's you know being presented as it's better than Oracle, you better have some amazing pedigree to, to, to get people there. And you know, if it's like, well, hey, look, we're you know a bunch of engineers and we worked at Oracle for the last you know decade and we've done all these amazing things in that time and you know, we're backed by, you know, this, you know, visionary, amazing, uh, you know, technologist that you've heard of, um, and, you know, Bill Gates uses it, uh, and insists that Microsoft use it internally for all these other products. I mean, you, you need some serious pedigree yeah. to be able to approach people. No, that's great uh, advice. It's for business. You're asking them, like, who's going to, you know, it's one thing to, you know, say I'm going to try out some product for personal use, but, you know, are you going to put your job on the line? That's, that's a tough uh, call to ask people. Now, Media Spike originally only worked for Flash and JavaScript. I think I have that right. You can tell me if I'm wrong. But you guys right. have recently released an SDK for iOS and Android. Um, how big of a deal is this for you guys? It seems like this opens up a huge market now. Yeah, I mean, without a doubt, like I, I think that um, the, the there's overwhelming excitement for for mobile right now and. You know, there's obviously the you know I, I, the the flash gaming world is not going anywhere. It's <laughs> phenomenal and, and it's doing exceptionally well. But uh, you know, mobile is really capturing the, uh, the the hearts and minds of the people lately. And because it has so much mind share, obviously, that 
just uh, it has, has, has it's been awesome for us, as you can imagine, because you know there were many conversations where we were like, okay, let us know as soon as you have mobile. And you know, if I, you know, unlike any entrepreneur, like if I could have everything immediately, uh, I would have, right? Um, so, uh, so it was very exciting for us to get our, our mobile out in the wild and to have you know people start using it. Um, and and the results there are phenomenal too. Uh, mobile in particular, um, you know, there's there's a lot of questions around uh, monetization for mobile, mm -hmm. and um, you know, it's exciting to be part of the narrative there where it's like, ah, yes, you can monetize on mobile, mm -hmm. you know, and here's one really cool way, um, and it's not, you know. I think you know a lot of the early monetization on mobile we've seen has not been, you know, really suited for mobile. It's simply like, okay, how do I take, uh, a, you know, this existing technology that works well on desktop and translate it to mobile? And not everything perfectly translates, yeah. right? And that's why you know, I mean, banners do not perfectly translate into the mobile world. Yeah. It just. It, well, it, I but, love the know, video on your guys' uh, homepage. I believe it's the video. It has the the banner ad pop up, and you click the X over and over. I was watching that the other day. And me and my son have that experience every night. Before we go to bed, me and him play games on the iPhone. And there's all these pop-ups. I'm like, look, I'm just trying to chill with my son for a few minutes. Like, I'm not looking to go into some other experience right now. <laughs> like, why would you think that? <laughs> I don't think I've ever clicked or I've ever clicked on a mobile banner intentionally. Not one. I, I think it's always I been really like, how do I get that little X in my, my finger? I mean, yeah. not that. I feel like I should get extra points in the game if I can get the X on the first try. <laughs> I know, right? That would be awesome. <laughs> like, that's the real game in the game right there. Um, so let me ask you this. What's your plan to, to reach those developers? Are they just kind of beating down the door like, oh, finally, iOS, Android? Or do you still have to have kind of a, a strategy to go and to build that side of the market again? So, we, I mean, we obviously, we have several strategies. But you have a sales team, obviously. And, and I mean, and they're phenomenal. They, 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 bring, you know, they bring their own pedigree. And I mean, largely for us, our biggest strategy in terms of you know building up this marketplace is hiring the right talent and, and getting the right people on either side of the table. Because there are some people that have you know amazing histories in the, in the brand agency world, and bringing some of those people on on board uh, uh, has opened up a lot of conversations there. And, and same thing on the on the developer side for games, where it's like, okay, you know, obviously, while well, I do know a number of people. You know, by bringing in the right salespeople, it, it's opened up so many more doors for us and, and helped those conversations uh, accelerate. So it's it's really I mean, the key there is getting the right team. Yeah. But uh, yeah, I mean, no, you know, sense. obviously, I mean, you have to have a product that works, but that's not sufficient. A lot of people say, "Ah, we built this amazing thing. Now everyone's going to come and demand usage of it." Mm -hmm. Well, you know, people are busy. Right? They they have you know their their work is full of other things that they need to get done. And you know, getting you know an amazing product backed by you know amazing team mm -hmm. is, is kind of what gets you you know in in in, in people uh, you know gets you at, you know in, in front of their mind and makes them you know say like oh okay, we're gonna actually let's let's try this out and see the results and so that's that's been the key there. Let me ask you about Zynga for a moment because Zynga they focused almost exclusively on uh, virtual goods for their monetization and yeah. they. You know they're in trouble. <laughs> you know, for all intents and purposes, um, do you think that their short, you know, comings kind of validates your vision of the future? That the vision of the future is these kind of in-product, in-game things. Well, I think that you know, without a doubt, I mean, Zynga's like fastest-growing revenue stream. I believe they're. Well, I, I say without a doubt. I need to be careful. My understanding is Zynga's fastest-growing revenue stream right now is their advertising division. Um, so there's there's without a doubt a lot of room for them to continue to grow there, mm -hmm. and I think that you know I mean Zynga as a business I, I am actually very bullish on I, I think it's you know they they built something phenomenal they do have an amazing amount of talent over there mm -hmm. um, now obviously they they you know they I think that you know bringing in you know other revenue streams you know very large ones and and getting you know getting those right is going to be huge for them I think that. Uh, with you know, without a doubt, and I'm, I'm I guess I'll be the first to say that I think that you know, product placement could be a huge, huge part of the revenue for them. Mm -hmm. um, and I think that you know, they're they're also you know, they're in an interesting time frame where you know, uh, you know, Facebook is shifting a lot of their attention to mobile, and so is Zynga, mm -hmm. and and they're doing really well there. It's just I think that you know, that uh, what's a good way to put it is you know that that amazing hyper growth can only go for so long before you do start to there's only so many people in the world right you know <laughs> and products can grow faster than uh, and then we're making new people so I, I think that, you know Zynga you know like maybe they're not growing like this anymore maybe they're growing like that 
and and you know, it's not that this is is bad. Mm -hmm. This is still a phenomenal success story. It's just everybody expected this to go indefinitely, and and, and it, you know, yeah, yeah. I mean, Google uh, is, is another example of that. Like, I remember like their their stock took a beating at one point, and you know, it it it, it was you know, it was just going amazingly fast, and you know, and, and Apple has this thing where it's like, okay, you know, you're this amazing company, and you're doing really well, and you have to not just outperform analyst estimates. But you have to outperform by a certain percentage mm -hmm. for people to say, ah, oh, that company's doing well. And I mean, like, that's just, that, that's tough. Yeah. <laughs> so, and when you're approaching it being a trillion dollar company, which Apple was trying to become at one point, it's like, oh, after you pass a trillion, do you get to two trillion? No. Like, I mean, we're in reality here. <laughs> and, and, I mean, you know, it's a phenomenal success story. Zing is a phenomenal success story. And I think that, you know, um, if, 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 you know, their growth rate is not as, you know, fast as it used to be, uh, it doesn't mean that it's you know bad. It's just that you know it, it, you know growth rates do not continue at you know amazing numbers indefinitely, right? No, it makes a lot of sense. Well, Blake, this has been an awesome interview. Let me ask you a couple final questions, um, kind of high level, um, to give back to the startup community for just a second. Uh, you are a mentor to many startups. Uh, you're an advisor to many startups in the valley. There, uh, what do you wish that more startups understood about growth? What do you find yourself just wishing they got? before you had to tell them. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, the, the, the two things I wish that they understood more than anything else was just that they're, they aren't their user. You know, I spoke about this a little bit. Mm -hmm. They are they are different than their user. And so when they use, so their intuition sometimes can be very, very off in terms of like, is this too much? Or am I pushing too much on in terms of, you know, engaging with the user or having my product reach out to them? Mm -hmm. So I think that use their intuition, what they should do is actually measure the results and see, because too often people say, like, well, wait a minute, I mean, imagine Groupon, imagine if Groupon had said, like, well, instead of sending everyone a daily deal, like, that's too much, that, you know, I wouldn't respond to that, let's do once a month, because that seems about right, mm -hmm. it would be a dramatically different user experience, and, and dramatically different, probably, success trajectory for them, I think that, uh, you know, if their intuition got in the way, someone may have, you know, kind of put it up like that, but... The truth of the matter is, they they test it every day, and it, and it got phenomenal results. And I think that's what you have to do is you have to test it and see, um, and you know, obviously back off if if the users are unsubscribing in droves and saying this is awful, I can't stand it. Then yes, you know, um, but uh, letting your intuition guide you can sometimes be wrong because you're not your customer. Um, and then probably the next thing I think that a lot of people don't focus on, which is a real shame, is they don't focus on retention and really understanding like how do I have a that's addictive because that's this cornerstone of growth that a lot of people don't get right in terms of they just want to like you know get this out and get you know make it touch as many people as they can mm -hmm. but um, you know probably the easiest way to th analogy or the easiest way to think about this is like okay you know in a, in a baseball game if, if you had one opportunity you know one pitch where you had to hit a home run and if you didn't get it it's you know go home forever you know you you, you know no more opportunities to play um, that's a very different experience than if you get like you know the field reserved for two years and you get to you know you know swing after swing after swing to try and get it right. Mm -hmm. um, and that's that's really fundamentally what you're doing when you make a product that people are addicted to and come to and use every day because it gives you the opportunity to test and tweak and really learn and and and, and optimize and, and get the right growth experience. So you need them using it every day, and a lot of people kind of they neglect that part of it. And you can imagine, like, if you have a hundred tries to get growth right, then that's much better than just one try, right? And and that's what a lot of people kind of uh, they are like, okay, I got this one growth thing, and I'm I'm gonna, you know, it seems to be working, so I'm just gonna keep doubling down on that, mm -hmm. and they neglect the uh, the uh, that 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 kind of like recurring addictive user experience that you want, that that you know gives you a million times to to get it right. No, that's well, a million, 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 million exaggerating. That's a little bit of hyperbole. <laughs> <laughs> that's right. <laughs> Just want multiple chances to get it right and to test things out, without a doubt. Absolutely. Well, Blake, thank you so much for being on the program. Your advice has been awesome. Uh, the things you've been involved in have been awesome. And thanks so much for taking the time out of your day. I really appreciate it. I, I, uh, I uh, hope it was helpful and uh, uh, look forward to other chances to uh, hopefully be helpful again in the future.